Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to Privacy Lab. Is there anyone here who has never been to one of our Privacy Labs? Oh wow, we have quite a few. Okay, well welcome. So I'm Stacy Martin. I work for Mozilla and I'm one of the hosts of Privacy Lab. And we follow a pretty standard format for those who haven't been here before. Um, we usually have a speaker or two on a topic of the month and they will talk for between an hour to an hour and a half depending on how many speakers we have. And then the time that's left over at the end, you'll have some time to talk in small groups or to each other and just some general networking time. We'll also allow a little bit of time for questions after each of the presentations. Um, tonight we'll have two and I'll talk about what those are as soon as I cover logistics. So we usually cover a little bit of logistics at the beginning as well. So we like to tell you what's coming up in, um, oh, but before I do that, there's a couple things I wanted to do. Uh, some thank yous. So we wanted to thank ICSI for hosting us tonight. And then we also wanted to thank Passcode for bringing us the live stream tonight. So this is being recorded. Um, it's the speaker portion that will be recorded. The networking time at the end will not be recorded. Um, but we really wanted to thank Passcode for um, bringing us the live stream. Um, in terms of what's coming up, so next month, Privacy Lab will be a little earlier than usual. It's usually the last week of the month, but we're going to move it up one week so that we can host it at UC Hastings. And the topic next month will be EU privacy. So if anybody's been wondering what's new with the EU privacy, it's a great opportunity to learn about the privacy impacts of Brexit, uh, GDPR, Privacy Shield, possibly e-privacy. We'll have a panel of experts on EU privacy next month. Um, October will probably be a cybersecurity type of theme since it's Cybersecurity Month. We're actually still looking for speakers for October, so if anyone knows of a speaker, that would be great. Um, and if you're interested in volunteering to host, if you want to be like me and stand up here <laughs> and introduce everyone and welcome everyone, um, we like to rotate that because Privacy Lab is designed to be a community event, so we don't want just me to be standing up here every month. And and we want to give everyone a chance to be able to do that, to be able to host. Um, we tend to move Privacy Lab around, so it's a different location every month. So if you have ideas for where it could be or topics you have in mind, let us know. We still have a couple more left um, till the end of the year. Um, let's see, I think that's the logistics. Does anybody have questions on the logistics? Okay, um, so let me briefly introduce our speakers. So we're gonna have two sets of speakers. Our first speakers will be Aaron Berman and Julie Oborny from the San Jose Public Library. And they will be talking about um, what's behind me here, the Virtual Privacy Lab, which is a project they did with the Knight Foundation. And then you'll get a chance to ask them some questions. And afterwards, we will have the teaching privacy team from ICSI, including Dr. Gerald Friedland, Julia Burns, and Sergey Engelman. Um, and you'll be able to ask them questions afterwards as well. So I'm gonna turn it over to Aaron and Julie now to talk about the virtual privacy lab. Thank you very much. Right. All right, thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Um, as Stacy mentioned, my name is Erin Berman and I'm the Innovations Manager for San Jose Public Library. Um, as the Innovations Manager, it's my responsibility to seek out really new avenues for service for our patrons and create partnerships with community stakeholders and investigate kind of new ways to ensure that technology me needs are being met for all of our citizens throughout San Jose. Um, I was also the Project Manager for the Virtual Privacy Lab. And I'm Julia Borney. I'm a web librarian for San Jose Public Library. My focus is on um, data analytics, uh, usability, design and development for our online experiences uh, for our patrons. And then my biggest project to date has actually been the Virtual Privacy Lab. I was one of the lead designers and developers of the Virtual Privacy Lab. 
So today we're actually going to talk to you about the process of transforming this really broad, intimidating topic like online privacy into a learning opportunity that is personal, it's approachable, actionable, and reusable. We're going to talk to you about the process that led us to building the Virtual Privacy Lab. We're going to give you a tour of the lab and provide some action items on how you might even be able to assist us in um, helping us and people around the world become more privacy literate. So what is the Virtual Privacy Lab? Well, it's an online platform which really empowers people to make informed decisions about their online behaviors. We at San Jose Public Library, or SJPL, as I'll probably refer to it, uh, is we believe that privacy literacy is really an essential component for our community to members to be able to confidently navigate online and to be able to make informed decisions about their online behaviors. So with the Virtual Privacy Lab, or the VPL, we wanted to provide an online learning opportunity that objectively offered information about various privacy-related topics. So many privacy tools that we saw kind of offered audiences a, a really biased outlook on privacy. They were telling users that there was a right way or a wrong way to behave online. Uh, I think most of us understand that our online lives really mirror our offline identities and they're richly diverse. And people have different needs from day to day, from year to year, sometimes even from hour to hour. And our lab really informs people and gives users the tools to make their own decisions online. Users are guided through seven different modules and then they're asked questions about their individual privacy preferences. So based on those answers, they're given a personalized toolkit with links and tips and resources which will assist them on helping uh, to become safe and confident online. This includes information, information for small businesses and nonprofits on how they can even be responsible stewards for their customers' information. We, we not only wanted the VPL to be personalized with questions, but also through language. And so we ensured that all the content was also translated into Spanish and Vietnamese, which are the two other biggest languages spoken in San Jose. So we're gonna delve more into detail about all of these different areas. Um, but before we begin, I think it's really important for us to talk about why libraries. So focusing on big issues related to privacy is really not new to libraries. Uh, the American Library Association's Intellectual Freedom Manual states, a democratic society operates best when information flows freely and is freely available. It is the library's unique responsibility to provide open, unfettered, and confidential access to that information. So libraries have always been one of the few places that you could gain access to information on any subject and from a variety of perspectives. Reading is one of our greatest freedoms and the library is where you can go to exercise that freedom. It's an open and free marketplace where people exchange knowledge and information without fear of reprisal. The American Library Association, or ALA, tells us that privacy is essential to the exercise of free speech, free thought, and free association. In a library, the subject of a user's interests should not be examined or scrutinized by others. This stance on users' privacy was challenged with the introduction of the Patriot Act and Section 215, which was soon known as the Library Provision. So this section actually allowed the government to come in and request patron records without a warrant. So what would happen is they would actually get a um, national security letter sent to a library that said you're not allowed to tell anybody that you received this letter, not even a lawyer, um, and you must hand over the requested documents. Um, in 2005, four librarians actually decided to not follow that. They contacted the ACLU, they fought and won, um, and they're the only ones so far that we know of who have actually stepped this national security letter. Um, libraries across the country stopped collecting patron records. So if you go into a library right now and check out a book, we'll know what book you have while you have it, but once you turn it back in, we, de keep, we destroy those records so that nobody can come in and request those records because we don't have them anymore. Uh, libraries even started putting up signs, warrant canary signs in their buildings saying, the FBI has not been here, please look closely for the removal of this sign. 
So this importance of ensuring users' privacy has extended beyond books in the digital age. The ALA's Intellectual Freedom Committee actually just recently, a few weeks ago, released the privacy, new privacy guidelines that outline strategies and best practices for protecting patron privacy in a digital environment. So these actually include guidelines for public access computers and networks, library websites, online public access computers, discovery services, library management service systems, data exchange between network devices and services, and gives like libraries a really good guideline to base all their services and make sure they're maintaining privacy in their patrons' information. Libraries are like one of the only places that are striving to ensure transparent privacy policies and practices across the board with customer information. They're minimizing the amount of data that they collect while there are scores and scores and more tools available for us to collect more and more information. We're actually making a stance to not utilize some of those tools in order to protect our patrons' privacy. So in our case, we actually had to carefully consider like, what providing open, unfettered, and confidential access to information really meant within the context of empowering people to make informed decisions about online privacy. So there were a lot of things that we considered. You know, how do we make information about online privacy easily accessible to people? How do we ensure patron confidentiality in the process? And how do we avoid making assumptions about our users and their diverse relationships to privacy? With this rich history of privacy advocacy and experience in teaching many different forms of literacy, it seemed like a really just a natural fit for the library to find a way to help our patrons become more privacy literate. So everyone in this room is aware that privacy is a big issue. You know, Apple and the FBI, Edward Snowden, major corporation hacks, social media, privacy policies, it's, it's in the news. It's not just people who work in the internet ecosphere who care about online privacy anymore. Our online idea, our online lives are becoming more and more integrated into our offline identities, and we have this really ever-increasing need to become more privacy literate. So we found that our patrons were coming to us and asking for help, like they do in the library. They come to us and ask for help on things. But um, we didn't really have the resources to help them. So we wanted to provide a fun and educational resource to our patrons, and we asked ourselves this question. How might we empower people to make more informed decisions about online privacy issues? In October of 2014, the Knight Foundation asked libraries across the country, how might we leverage libraries as platforms to build more knowledgeable communities? And SJPL submitted a proposal to the challenge. Our original proposal actually um, said that we would take 24 months to develop a number of compelling, easy to use privacy literacy tools so that community members could really better understand what happens to their information, make more informed decisions about their online activity, and safeguards that they may want to employ. We would host public dialogues with speakers representing a range of fields, um, and we would share all of this broadly. We would also create a DIY privacy literacy toolkit, um, which would be built and include uh, an individual privacy assessment and information on tools to kind of safeguard your privacy. So our original budget was about, our proposed budget was $720,000 over 24 months, um, with a request for Knight to give us $404,000. Um, we made it through the first round and into the semifinals, but we were not selected as one of the final winners of the main challenge. Instead, we were given a prototype grant. So instead of $400,000, we were given $35,000 um, and six months. And um, we were told in those six months to create a prototype of our original project. Um, so <laughs> as part of that, um, they actually provide this really cool training opportunity. And they flew me out to Pittsburgh to go to the Luma Institute, which teaches some design thinking um, techniques. And so I went up there, tried to soak up as much information as I possibly could, came back to the library, created a team of people at the library who would work on building this prototype. 
but we didn't really know much more of what we were going to do other than it was going to be a privacy literacy tool of some kind. You know, our original project scope of 24 months and, you know, $800,000 was um, a little bit too much to undertake in six months and $35,000. So we decided to really kind of narrow it down and focus on one key component of that project, which we thought was interesting, which was the DIY privacy literacy toolkit. And having some kind of tool um, for learning and doing an individual privacy assessment. So with our team assembled, we actually began the research phase of the project. So we're all librarians, um, and as you can imagine, we really like doing research and finding things. <laughs> um, so we spent several weeks actually really doing this like deep dive into the world of privacy and privacy education. There were um, spreadsheets developed um, on like matrix to like analyze what different offerings each of these different privacy tools had so we can evaluate them. Um, it was a whole new area for a lot of us, and we identified several kind of key problems that we saw with the privacy education landscape. The first one though is that it's pretty scary. Um, lots of sites out there are kind of doom or gloom. Uh, the more and more you start looking into privacy, the more you want to grab your tinfoil hat and throw your phone into the river and never touch a computer again. At least that's how some of us started feeling as we started learning more about a lot of this stuff. Um, but the majority of us want to have online banking. And we want to communicate with our friends on Facebook. And we want to have an online life. And so how do we do that? These sites were telling us that if you know we didn't install their software or their app, then pretty much all of our information was going to get stolen. And everything was going to end up um, you know, in the hands of thieves and murderers. And um, you know, we should build a wall around our personal identities. Um, we also found that it was pretty overwhelming. So if you go online right now and type privacy into Google, you're going to get 5 billion results back. Um, if you narrow it a little bit and type online privacy, you'll get around 2 billion results. So you know, how do you know where to start? How do you know who to trust? Um, and when most of us are presented with that many options, we just freeze up and don't do anything at all. Also, most of it was boring. Um, it's not exactly a sexy or exciting topic for most of us to begin with, um, but a lot of the stuff out there was pretty lack lackluster. It wasn't interactive. Um, there was no personalization. And they were all very one size fits all. So they just assumed everybody had the exact same needs online, and there was one prescription and one way to do it. And yeah, so let's see here. So we did find, though, that people were really hungry for information. Even though it's scary and overwhelming, people were seeking out this information. So you can see here some results of a, of a fairly recent Pew study that was asking people about online privacy. People don't feel like they have control over their information, but they want to know who has access to it. They want to have that control. So it was our assumption that if people were given like a fun platform to learn about privacy that had tailored resources that were specifically designed for them from an institution that inspired trust, a library, um, they'd be more likely to take action and help them feel safe and confident online. So it was with this in mind that we began di diving into what kind of platform we would use to help people become more privacy literate. Uh, after we'd done all this kind of initial research, uh, looking into privacy education products, uh, serving the privacy landscape in general, reading studies and articles, uh, we put on our tinfoil hats and we you know, set out to make our prototype. So like I said, we did um, this, we gathered the team together and we did this half day design thinking workshop. And we did a lot of kind of fun up on our feet um, tools and, and we looked at all the research that we'd gathered and we've been again talking about who our stakeholders were and who would use this prototype. And we came up with that big picture question that I talked about earlier of, you know, how might we empower people to make informed decisions about online privacy issues? And then next we developed a set of community interview questions because we knew that before we built anything, the number one thing that we had to do was actually go talk to our stakeholders. And we had to make sure that our assumptions 
actually met their needs and we weren't just building something based on what we thought they wanted. And then we did some sketches. We each sat down and we sketched what we thought the solution to that question might be. How might, what platform might we build? And when we looked at all of our sketches together as a group, we discovered all of them were games. Every single one of them was a game. Um, everybody wanted something that was fun. They wanted something that people could interact with. They didn't want it to be boring. And so at the end of that workshop, we knew we wanted to build a game and we knew that we wanted to go out there and talk to people and make these personalized toolkits. So we went out and we talked to teenagers, we talked to seniors, we talked to everybody in between, and we asked them all a series of questions. The first thing we did was we asked, tell me a story about your daily online routine. It's really fascinating to hear people like talk about from the second you wake up in the morning till you go to bed at night, like what's your experience with technology and what do you do online? We asked what the word privacy meant to them. What does the word online privacy mean? to you. We asked if they thought about, how often they thought about who has access to their information, and if they'd ever been surprised by something they thought was private online, but actually turned out wasn't. People had some interesting stories about that. Um, we asked why they thought privacy might be important online. Um, we asked if they had multiple identities, and if so, what were, like, how did they manage those different identities? Did they do different things? Um, did they behave differently on their tablet or computer than they did on their personal desktop? Did they behave differently at work than they did at home? Um, you know, and what did they want to learn more about? We found, generally speaking, that most of our assumptions, uh, most of our assumptions met what we talked about with our community, and we really found that privacy was a fluid definition. It was not the same for everybody, um, and that everybody was using the internet differently. While there were some core things that people use the same way, lots of people, you know, t even through teenagers, would use the internet differently from teen to teen. But above all else, people wanted to know more. So we found four main themes in our community. They wanted to know who was using their information, how they got it, what they will do with it, and how they could protect it. So now we had all this rich content from our community and a map of the privacy landscape. We started building our prototype. However, we couldn't do it alone. Um, and so Julie's gonna come and she's gonna continue speaking about our partnerships, um, the first prototype we built, and how that grew into the virtual privacy lab, which you'll see shortly. All righty. So Aaron already mentioned um, there was a game theme, so we decided to build a game. Uh, we, had, we originally thought we'd build an app and um, the majority of the funds would go to you know, getting developers to be able to build that, that game for us. Um, but when we looked at our community and then we also looked at the long-term feasibility, we decided that we really wanted to focus on content because that's something that can be reusable outside of the rapid prototype vacuum that we were currently in. Um, so we brought on two partners. The first one was the International Computer Science Institute, who's here today, um, ICSI, and they uh, developed the content for us. Um, uh, and then we also had San Jose State University. Uh, they have like a special group called the Game Dev Club. It's just a student group, and they, they helped to build the actual game portion of it. Um, we started out, though, with a paper prototype, so I'm gonna share a few little screenshots of our little paper prototype that we made. Um, this is actually a pretty interesting one because there's a lot of demographic information that we ask about, uh, and that's something that we started off thinking that we would really need because we wanted to be able to customize the game experience. And then also we wanted to be able to have some, um, some uh, s demographic information for like reporting and that kind of stuff, uh, which ends up changing as we go through some iterative uh, cycles of design. Uh, we also made some assumptions about our UI controls, uh, such as mixing keyboard and mouse controls. So during our testing phase with our paper, paper prototype, we had um, the, these 
oversized like space bar and cursor keys. Um, and then we had people use their finger as a mouse, which um, when you're testing like that, people start using it more like a touch screen than a mouse. So that's another assumption we made during the paper prototype process, which ended up being, uh, we ended up using that more um, as, an, as an idea for you know, how we wanted to be able to maybe translate that into a mobile experience as well. And then um, this kind of shows sort of uh, what the beginning of the game was. So it's like a platformer game. We had instructions at the beginning explaining what the objective was. Um, you end up hitting those little question marks and then um, a question would appear and then you'd have to answer it to progress through the game. So this is an example of like a question and Erin did a lot of our testing during this and so those little dowel rods, she'd have to like move it along on the... Uh... We were like puppet masters. <laughs> <laughs> like... She was way better at it than I was. I was like, when we had somebody that we had to test and like um, <laughs> she was gone, I was like, I don't think I'm gonna be able to move these along. Um, oh, did I... The next one. Oh, so we had questions that were comprehension questions. You'd get a, like a little bit of information, and then you'd have to answer like a comprehension question. And then towards the end, you would get um, some opinion questions, like you know, how do you how do you feel about this particular privacy thing? Um, <coughs> Okay, great. All right, so after the testing process, um, a lot of assumptions that we had made made sense, and so we were like, all right, let's go ahead and build this, and um, this is what we ended up with. So hopefully this is not too loud. Which one? Yep. This one, okay. So here's our little platformer game here. So you can see the little guys like running across, we're using cursor keys. You get information that's to the left because that's what we were able to do when we were building, um, maybe I need to turn this down a little bit for our online audience. Um, uh, so after reading the information, you get a comprehension question, you have to answer it, you get more information. Um, and then, there were some like pause moments to kind of encourage people to read all of the content. Um, and then this was actually, this is gonna take a little bit to go through, so I'll explain how we, how we built it too. So we used uh, Construct 2, which um, allowed us to make an HTML5 game, so it was web-based. Um, and then it uses a little bit of JavaScript so that uh, you can have the question interaction. And then you get towards the end. This is still a comprehension question. I might skip. So then you get through here and you get some, you know, how do you feel about this particular privacy thing? And then they'll answer it. And then towards the end, then at the end, they'll get what we, at the time we were calling a privacy path. And it's a list of action items and um, resources and tools to be able to optim optimize your privacy. If anybody missed anything, they had to go back got to change the music, that was really fun for me to try to figure out, because I had never built a game of it before in my life. Um, and then, I did, then after that you can get, like, we wanted to make sure that there was a way to be able to get a copy of the, of the privacy path, so we had an email option and then we also had a print option. And so during user testing we actually, gave these, uh, this print option to our users because we wanted to be able to come back to them after, like about a week or so after, to be able to ask them like, oh, thank you. Uh, to be able to ask them, you know, did you take any action, like what type of actions have you taken since, since that time period? Uh, so, we found after we did our user testing that, um, we had some positive results, so our goal was that we wanted it to be fun, but we also wanted people to be able to learn something new, and you can see 80% said they learned something new. Um, uh, 
they, we also had people that actually took some steps after um, with the with the printout, and so that number is a little bit lower here, but. Um, Part of that, I think, is because we, with the privacy path, the, the links for those are, some of them are really long URLs. Um, so we felt like if we could flush this out into like a fully formed online game, then people would probably take more actions in that moment um, because they could just click a link instead of having to type in something really long. So with that, we, we thought we had built something successful. Um, However, um, our rapid prototype was just a vertical slice of what that game could be. Um, we had seven privacy-related topics that ICSI created for us, but we only built one level. Um, so we looked into making a large-scale game uh, with all seven levels. Uh, and then some updates that we were interested in making. For example, in the testing process, we found like using cursor keys and using the mouse is kind of like not an intuitive thing for, a lot, for some people. And so having like mobile options, you know, those kind of things were things we wanted to be able to do. Um, so we thought the game was pretty fun, um, but we didn't really have the time in-house to, to create a full game. And then when we looked at, uh, the initial scope of what it would take to build that game. Uh, it was going to take like a year and $150,000. So we were like, okay, what can we do to push this content out to our customers as quickly as possible? And that's where the virtual privacy lab comes in. So um, we built the virtual privacy lab uh, on our Drupal instance, so uh, we're a Drupal 7 house on sjpl.org. Um, I, I I'm comfortable with Drupal development and so was our other lead developer. Uh, so we felt like it was an easy transition to try to find solutions there. Um, we also needed to figure out how to turn that privacy path that we had created into something that could be more like web-based um, and on our website. So we, we had determined that one of the best ways to do that would be by using a contrib module called the quiz module. And um, that allowed us to be able to ask questions about people's privacy needs and then have it dynamically spit out like different action steps and stuff like that that were customized according to their needs. Some of the reasons that we, some of the other reasons we did that is that um, the Drupal community has a really big healthy community um, and also the quiz module also has a lot of people contributing to that and involved with that so there was a lot of documentation for us to be able to uh, build something out with that tool. Um, and then another reason we picked the quiz module is because um, people are kind of familiar with that quiz format. Like, I know I've been on certain social media sites that are like, oh, which Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle do you identify with most? Or what's your Game of Thrones sig sigil? You know, like that's, you know, those BuzzFeed style quizzes like people are familiar with. It's a low threshold for being able to get people on board with that. So that's another reason we chose the quiz module. Um, and then this is a screenshot of what the landing page for the virtual privacy lab looks like. On the top part, we have the construction zone, and that includes the seven topics that um, ICSI uh, built the content out for us. Um, and then the bottom part is actually our, it's, we have it called Level Up, and it's basically just some additional resources. And I'll go into those in a little bit more detail. Um, but I figured we'd go ahead and do a tour of the site. And I think we can do a live tour. I had a video back up. And unfortunately, you will not be able to listen to the really bad music that I added to that video <laughs> back up. Um, so our site is also mobile responsive. You'll, you'll notice that um, the layout looks a little bit different here, and that's because it responds depending on your screen width. Um, so we'll go ahead and just see what it looks like. Hopefully it's fast enough. Yeah. 
Um, so this is an example of one of the topics, data sharing and data mining. You can see we have like a, sh uh, like a brief summary of, of that topic, but then people can actually get more detailed information actually going, there, going to build a toolkit. So they do that by using that familiar quiz style. You answer a few questions. And there's one more question here. And then it generates the toolkit for you. Um, some of the things that we did bring over, obviously we brought over the content um, and we also made it modular. So we use, we utilize um, in Drupal, we have um, blocks and a module called Display Suite. So each of those little action steps is its own little Display Suite field code so that it gets reused in one spot and it makes it so much easier to just manage that and, and be able to update that in one location. So that's something we brought over and then also just being able to print it. So if people do want like a print copy, they can or they can email it to themselves for later. Another thing that we did is the quiz module actually will create like a temporary feedback page for the user but we wanted them to be able to go back to like a, something permanent if they wanted to. And so I just did like, a, instead of having like all the feedback on the feedback section, I added like a little JS redirect to get them to like a permanent page so that they could either bookmark, message to themselves, however they wanted to access that. You can also see it's in another langu other languages. I think we're running a little low on time, so if you guys want to explore those other languages, feel free. I'm going to go ahead and skip ahead a little bit. Um, let's go back to English. So for the Get Started Today page, uh, we decided to have some just some different tools and apps and resources that were like a quick way to get started if people did, didn't want to have to like go really in depth on a specific topic. Uh, some of the ways that we got this information, um, we went to a, uh, a conference called the Digital Rights and Privacy conference and that was put on by the Library Freedom Project so we were able to um, discover some resources and tools there and then we also tried to test a lot of the resources and tools that we included on there and we continue to um, monitor that uh, to make sure that um, the stuff is is current. We also have privacy at your library so we have stuff specifically for our customers um, you know, for example, we use like HTTPS on our website, those kinds of things. Um, and then also we have something about um, what the library community as a whole is doing to secure patron privacy and confidentiality. And then our final section is um, a more in-depth article that ICSI uh, cre created for us. Um, so that's a brief tour of what it looks like. Uh, present. Okay. Let me get back on track here. So one of the biggest challenges that um, we faced in developing um, the privacy, the privacy lab, particularly um, the toolkit portion, is how do we balance privacy with ease of use? Uh, there's a lot of features in the quiz module where you can um, track a lot of personally identifiable information that makes it really useful for a developer and an analytics nerd like myself to um, be able to help improve something. It, improve the design and development of the product and then also to be able to um, to uh, help help our users refer back to that tool but we didn't want to collect that information because we didn't want to expose our users to um, uh, a breach in their privacy 
I already talked about the JS redirect. Um, we also uh, have, we're using Google Analytics to be able to um, determine what topics are more popular and those kinds of things, but we have certain features disabled, like we're not collecting demogra demographic information. Um, the only thing that we collect when people actually build their toolkit is whether they went to the quiz page we don't know what what goes on during that, and then at the end, whether they um, had a had a result. That's it. That's the only so that that's how we're able to count. Like, okay, a toolkit was probably built here, and then we can also see if um, somebody actually clicked on an outbound resource, but we don't know who that person is. We have that com part completely disabled. And then, um, so now you kind of have an idea of the process of taking that broad, intimidating topic and turning it into something that's a little bit more manageable. Um, but our process is actually not complete. Uh, we actually want, part of that process is in encouraging current and prospective users to uh, participate. And part of that is either using the Privacy Lab, sharing it, or contributing in some way. Um, and why would you want to do that? First, it's personalized. You know, we have the general overviews, but you can you can build your own toolkit to get resources that are specific to you. Um, it's trusted. Aaron kind of already went over that. Um, you know, as a library, we have an we have a. Uh, reputation for being a, a trusted resource. We also use HTTPS on our website. Um, we deliberately disabled um, tracking for any personally identifiable information. Um, and then we also try to provide pr transparency about our own privacy practices with the at your at privacy at your library uh, page. We also wanted to be unbiased. Um, so we didn't want to be like, you must do this or everything's going to be, your, your entire life is going to be out there for the world to see. Um, we just wanted to be able to provide the information and people can use it or they don't have to use it. Um, and then another reason you might want to consider participating in our process is we're not selling anything. We're not saying, oh, buy this security tool or this privacy tool. Um, we also are actively engaged in a content audit. So our current uh, approach is um, we're constantly monitoring our, our links to make sure, like if, if there's a broken link, we fix it right away. Uh, we're also reviewing the news to make sure that particularly for the Get Started Today page, if there's something that, um, some update with some sort of tool. For example, CryptoCat for a while was like, they didn't really have um, an update for a while, so we had to take that down for a little bit. I just saw like earlier in the year that they have a de development team again, so that's something that we're actually looking into whether we want to add them back in. Um, and then we're also seeking out new partners to be able to update content annually. And then finally, we also um, are available in three languages, Spanish, English, and Vietnamese. Um, if you do only one thing after hearing us talk, just check sjpl.org slash privacy. Um, but Aaron's actually going to talk about some other things that you can do if you want to get more involved. So like Julie was saying, um, we are actively in the process of collecting and analyzing the data that we've gathered via Google, Google Analytics and Crazy Egg. Um, and using these data, data analytics tools, we've been able to determine some user behaviors regarding how people are using the virtual privacy lab. Um, and you know, looking at where they're going most frequently, what they're doing with the information. But, but some of that, we because we've um, turned off some of those analytics, we're not going to be able to discover unless we're actually doing in-person user testing. Um, and so we are looking at doing some of that this fall and into next year. And um, yeah, and so the other thing we're also looking to do, which is really important to us, is a content audit. So it's really it's great to build this wonderful tool, but the privacy landscape's 
changing. Internet's technology is always changing. Um, with ICSI, we were able to develop this, this really great content, and we tried to keep that challenge in mind. We tried to do our best to um, not provide links and resources that were super, super specific to um, you know, changing this particular website's privacy policies and, and settings, but um, you know, things change. Um, the world <laughs> moves. Um, and so while Julie was saying we have the tools to fix broken links, we want to be able to review all of the content on the site annually to make sure that it's up to date. Um, so we're, we're, um, our next step is we really need assistance in doing this complete audit of the current content that we have on the site. And we would actually like to bring on board any interested people that would like to help us kind of evaluate these resources um, and the content to make sure the information is still valid, um, to seek out new resources if there's something updated um, and replace it with the most current information available. If this is something that you might be interested in helping helping our team out with. Um, please contact Julie or myself afterwards. Uh, we'd be happy we're gonna start that up in the fall or early next year. Um, as Julie mentioned, we've also been working really hard on promoting the Virtual Privacy Lab to new audiences. And it's won awards in the library world, which we're really stoked on. It's getting out into the library world more often. We won the Reference and User Services Association's Excellence in Reference and Adult Services Award. Um, and we were recently awarded the California Library Association's Zoya Horn Intellectual Freedom Award. Um, Julie and I recently, um, with the help of Stacy, spoke at the National Network to End Domestic Violence's Tech Summit. So we got to introduce the lab to a whole new audience of people, and we kind of we want to keep on doing that. There's whole demographics of people that we think can really benefit from the lab. Like Julie was saying, we made a really big effort to make sure that none of the links or resources are to sites that sell anything. Um, everything's trusted. Um, one of the biggest things that you know we have besides the language is that. Um, there's resources for small businesses and nonprofits. Those kind of collected resources don't exist very many other places like this. Um, and it's, it's, it's really great not just for them to um, explore their own privacy practices, but also for their patrons' privacy as well. So please, you know, share it widely. Um, we are not looking for money from anybody. Please post it on your website, share it with your friends, your networks, your communities. We also have a table in the back that has bookmarks and pins and flyers, um, posters. Take them. Have plenty. Take as much as you want. Yeah. <laughs> um, so. and, and please just, you know, pass them out and spread the word and just help us in creating a more privacy literate, literate community worldwide. Uh, I think that's you know, all we're really looking for here. Um, and if you have any questions, um, our emails are up there too. If you want to take a picture, uh, you're welcome to and email us if you have any questions later. Or if you are interested in helping us with that content audit, we would really love your assistance as well. Thank you. Great. Um, does anyone have any questions for Aaron and Julie before we go to our next speakers? So how long does Do you want me to bring you the mic? Available to people? Um, it's been online since October. October 2015. Almost a year. So almost a year. And do you have a sense roughly of percent, like how many? Yeah, we've had about 6,000 um, toolkits, right? Or about 6,000 visitors. So 6,000 visitors, and then we've had maybe about 1,200 toolkits. Um, and then we know some other information too, kind of like you know those outbound links. For example, Just Delete Me happens to be one of the more popular links that people like to click on. So we look at all those things to kind of determine. We actually just made a change. Um, on the Privacy Lab in anticipation for our content audit, we want to make sure that certain, the layout of certain things is not impacting how our users are uh, picking topics and stuff. So we've kind of moved things around based on what we found in, in, in our data. Um, we saw that like the top three things that were being clicked on were the top three when you, yeah. And so we yes, moved. were like, let's flip them. Let's just see what happens. <laughs> and then when we do user testing, we can really confirm whether that's a thing. And that, you know, maybe it's we need to change the names on stuff and, and 
we just we didn't originally when we first launched have the time to do user testing like we did when we did the prototyping. And so we've been gathering analytics over the past year, but we haven't had a chance to do the in-person user tests yet. Okay, let me give you the microphone. Um, I think this is a, a great project. Uh, do you have a sense about whether or not people learn about it by actually coming to the library or whether or not they uh, find this online through social media or some sort of sharing mechanism? So it's actually a mix. Um, I created um, a custom report in Google Analytics to be able to help customers kind of get that feeling of the fine grain detail. Um, we, we get a lot of direct traffic, which is sort of an indicator that we have people that are actually manually, either manually typing in sjpl.org slash privacy, um, which usually means they've seen some of our marketing materials that we've had, or they've heard about it from other people, or maybe they've bookmarked it because they heard about it in some other way. But then we're also able to see, like, did they come here from Facebook? Did they come here from Twitter? Did they, um, you know, we can also see, like, you know, specific websites, like for example, Denver Public Library is one that um, uh, has shared the Privacy Lab on their actual website. We can see how many people are coming from there. So it gives us an idea. It's been really nice because we're able to be like, oh, this organization's like really interested in this topic. Maybe we can communicate this with them in the future and maybe partner on this particular topic in the future. It's nice too, because like we'll see spikes, like when we get an award, or it's mentioned in like a magazine, or it like it makes a difference. And for us, like I said, like our biggest thing is like as a librarian, like I just want more people to have information. Like this is it. And so we're just looking for as many avenues as possible to get the tool into people's hands. And I mean, I think for us, like we feel we've been successful so far. Even you know how six thousand people visit. You know we're a medium-sized library who hasn't ever done anything in the privacy world before, right? So for us, it's you know a good size for something library related for a database. <laughs> yeah, and also when you compare it to, um, so since I'm in charge of all the data, <laughs> um, we compare it to other parts of our website too, and it's got a, so you consider your landing page just like the most popular page. Um, and then like you go down from there and like it has a, little bit, all the, all the other pages have like point something percent for like where people go. This one's like a little bit higher than some of those, so that's like encouraging as well. Um, and then also the, the engagement is a little bit higher too. You can see how many, how long people are on that page and then like um, how many pages deep they've gone. So the, the pages per session is actually a little bit higher on the Privacy Lab compared to some of the other stuff other content on our website. Okay, do we have any other questions? Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Okay, so we will turn it over to the teaching privacy team. I think they just need a minute to plug in their slides. Hello? Works? Okay, good. Yeah, so uh, my name is uh, Gerald Friedland, and uh, this is Julia Burnt, and sitting in the audience is Serge Egelman. Mm -hmm. And we three have been working for a while, I think 2013, I was just asking, um, on a project called Teaching Privacy, and it was funded by NSF in two or three rounds. Um, depending on how you count, but it was funded by National Science Foundation mostly. Um, 
and it was a collaboration between ICSI, um, which is the institute we're in, and uh, UC Berkeley. And the interesting thing is also a little bit how we came to that project. Um, ICSI is, is, is mostly a nonprofit uh, that is doing computer science research, uh, often in, connect in connection with other universities, and of course the one that's really close. Um, but the interesting thing here is that by definition we didn't have an education track really, but what happened is that a couple of us researchers just stumbled upon some serious privacy issues and we were like, people need to know this, right? And then since we have a track record with NSF, we talked to them and this project happened and we we're really happy about this. Okay, so teaching privacy is one project and then Trope was the other project. So teaching privacy started first as like, oh my God, we need to educate people about privacy and also, and that was always important for me, from an angle of computer scientists. So my issue with many of the teaching sort of trying to teach privacy projects was that they came from law and they came from politics and they came from sociology and this is not wrong. I'm not saying that's wrong. The problem though is that many of them just ignored the fact that um, you know if you send an email it's routed through many many uh, machines and unless it's encrypted you know people can read it full stop. You can talk about it a long time but it's just what it is. Right and there were like lots of examples like this where I read this as a computer scientist and say well okay first start with how the internet works. It's been set up this way. I wish we could change it, we can't. So we need to actually start from there and then add all the other stuff. Um, so then later on, so we created this awesome site, which I'm gonna present in a while. And then what happened is teachers came and said, awesome, now you have this site, but how do I teach this? And then Trope was uh, basically, uh, uh, we started Trope to basically create teachers' resources for online privacy education to guide them through the materials of the teaching privacy site. Okay. Um, so yeah, and as I said before, I wanted this to be uh, wanted this to be a computer science approach. So it should be practical. Like, don't say like, don't do this, don't do that. But basically, say, hmm, have you actually taken a look at your privacy settings in Facebook? Right? Uh, accurate. As I said, we wanted to be really reflective on what the technical stuff is. Not hand wavy. The technical stuff can be accurate. Right? Um, and then comprehensive. Um, we often had these sessions, especially with Julia. Where we try to like be, be try to much as we can put in there with text um, and in as short as possible. It's not easy. Um, accessible, of course. So everything is Creative Commons zero, and it's in a website, and you can use the material. And interdisciplinary anyway, because we worked with a lot of people. So. Um, um, and so now we, the first thing came came said so like I'm teaching computer science and I want to give them something about privacy and then all these hands raise up and say, um, I when I click on a web page when I enter information in a form is it transferred when I click on the web page or before that? And actually, if you look into this by detail, you'll find out the answer to that is not so easy. Because before, it was kind of like you click, okay, then the information is transmitted. But with HTML5 and so on, information is actually transmitted right away when you type, because otherwise your draft couldn't be saved in Gmail, right? And that's some interesting thing because companies exploit that, especially one particular one that um, uh, sells drivers at to 17-year-olds and they put in their information and decide, ah, maybe that's sketchy cancel and then they get a follow-up call despite the fact that they press cancel you know and, and stuff like this and so teacher we, we, we didn't know how to actually how do we prepare teachers for this kind of situation when they talk about privacy and so this is what trope is about in the end um, we are pretty proud that this actually started to to disseminate so we have it in sort of in the AP computer science principles framework which is the approach to creating an AP advanced placement class in computer science nationwide and it also came became part of a couple other standards and also we teaching this in Berkeley as part of the beauty and joy of computing so how does this work? So we, uh, we decided, and there was many, many sessions, the, the way this should work is we create 10 principles that sort of cover the space as much as we can. Uh, so there's you leaving footprints, there's anonymity, information is valuable, and so on. And along these principles, uh, we present um, 
you know, sort of apps and information and and uh, exercises, but then also the teacher guidance, um, and uh, you know, this will be all shown in detail in a bit. So. Um, so the first principle, by the way, is your information footprint is larger than you think. And actually, the funny thing is this is kind of pretentious, right? It's larger than you think, right? Uh, having said that, I haven't seen anybody who uh, could not be proven that this is true. Um, it's really, really scary, right? <laughs> right? Um, yeah, I could go into detail with a lot of anecdotes here. Um, uh, one important principle also is information about you on the internet will be used by somebody in the interest, including against you. And then there's no anonymity. And it's interesting also because some of the principles actually will contradict itself. So we have the there's no anonymity, um, but then also uh, you, you, you basically you can't verify identity either, right? So <laughs> that's the other problem. And sort of uh, this is the, the email example, right? Sharing information over network means you give up control over that forever, right? And so sort of really the sentence, uh, you know, try to recognize uh, what, what it really means. Instead of saying don't do X, don't do Y, it's just basically a principle sort of like, you know, this is what it is, fact. And it was not so easy to create those, but, and I'm not, we're not really claiming that it covers the entire, entire space, but it's definitely a really um, comprehensive uh, way of thinking about this. Um, even though some of them are a little redundant. And then this I heard a lot. The, the online world is inseparable from the real world, right? And by the way, people were really angry about us, right? This is, how is real not part of online anyway, right? But, you know. And the other thing that's kind of interesting is just because something can't be found today doesn't mean it can't be found tomorrow. Um, you should try that with yourself, especially if you have a longer history. Um, um, yeah, and again, then identity is not guaranteed. You can't avoid having inf a footprint. Um, and that's actually the most actionable item. Um, so I had a, maybe here's an anecdote. Um, the anecdote is I had a reporter from the CBC, this Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, call us up and, and do this, uh, yeah, search knows this story, right? And she said, you know, you can actually look me up on the CBC side, you won't find me because I'm an investigative reporter, so I'm really like uh, trying to be anonymous. And what I want to do is, can you do the Dave experiment? And the Dave experiment is where they invited people, this is a video online, um, to basically come in um, and they casted them and they had them fill out forms. And then the people where they found a lot online had them come in and then um, sort of, uh, uh, Dave was acting as a clairvoyant and then saying, you know, you probably know this video and you should look that up on you. And then saying, oh, you know, I know, you know, you built that, you, you bought that house and you have three boyfriends and so on and these kind of things. And she, she asked me, can you do that? I said, yeah, sure. Okay, so try it on me first. And I said, okay, I will take 60 minutes. I don't have a lot of time. I will just take 60 minutes and I will not use any sources where I have to pay money. I will just use social media. And I found out where she lived. I found out uh, where her parents lived, when they died, what her boyfriend is, the last couple trips with her boyfriend, her birth date, uh, why the house was demolished that she lived in before, uh, all of this kind of information. And then she asked me in the end, so wow, how did you do that in 60 minutes? And I said, well, it's pretty easy. Uh, remember that and on the East Coast? And she's like, oh yeah, I, I, never I'm really never in touch with her and I said yeah but she likes you a lot and she posts about you on Facebook including when you have your birthday and so on and so forth and this is basically the most actionable lesson that actually comes out of this sort of summarizing this in 15 minutes is first of all you can't avoid having an information footprint but the the, the other thing is you know if you want to be private then you actually need to talk to everybody to not post about you and also don't post about others right so that is the the, the most important thing um, the, first one the first one identity is not guaranteed Identity is not guaranteed. So if you if you talk as a as a high schooler to somebody on a chat and he pretends to be somebody, how will you know, right? Right? I mean, um, at the other at the other end though, so uh, anonymity is not guaranteed either, right? So a bigger entity can find out about you, but you as a small entity cannot find out about who whoever is talking to you, right? And then in the end, it's only you have an interest in maintaining your own privacy. That is really the point. Um, and it's sort of, this is 
you know, everybody else, you know, government, industry, they all don't care. You you care. And actually, your relatives don't care so much either, as I just said. Right? So it's really just you. Um, so um, there's the website. I don't know. This is, is this 11? Is this taking over? OK. So these were sort of the principles. And now Julia is going to show you what we built around them. Okay. I have my mic. I have oh, my mic. Yes. So, um, do I need to push any buttons? OK. OK. Um, so as we distilled all those principles, um, the first thing that we did in sort of a more um, public just general public education uh, resource that we built um, was the Teaching Privacy website, um, which we organized around um, those 10 principles just to kind of have an organizing principle for it. Um, and so most of, the, or most of the examples that I'm gonna give um, will be around that first principle, your information is larger than you think. Um, so we have a web page for each of the principles um, where we start with explaining how it works, um, so for example, with your leaving footprints, um, it's you know, sort of all of the different things that go into your information footprint, how that information gets online. Um, for example, geotags um, on social media posts, um, uh, EXIF data in uh, multimedia, um, and then um, the information that is transmitted by your devices, IP addresses, unique, I unique uh, device IDs, et cetera. Um, and then, we have um, a bunch of resources, articles, and including and some advice what you can do about it. Um, so in this case, um, a lot of it focuses on uh, privacy settings, particularly um, location services. Um, one of the interesting challenges here, um, as Aaron and Julie were saying, is to how to give advice that isn't so specific that it's only relevant for one app or that's going to stay relevant for the next few years. Um, so it kind of tends to be a little more abstract um, about, you know, go look at the apps, the, the, you know, the social media um, sites that you use, the apps you use, look at your um, privacy settings um, and try and, you know, and ask yourself these questions. Do, you, you know, do I really want these people to be able to see that, this type of information? Um, and again, it's, it's not trying to necessarily dictate a specific um, program, but just, you know, make sure you review it and make sure that it does actually align with what you want. Um, and again, communicating about preferences, um, which could, you know, op opting out with companies, but then also, um, as Gerald was saying, um, talking to people that you know um, about your preferences. Um, so, you know, so we created this website. It was, we, it was originally um, with teachers in mind, um, sort of helping them to understand, but also for the public. But then, um, you know, okay, that's great, but what can we actually, we can't actually just you know, use it in the classroom. We can't just tell our students, hey, go to this website. Um, so then we um, got another grant to create um, a bunch of classroom resources. Um, so videos, apps, slide decks, activity guides, discussion guides, quizzes. Um, all those kind of things. Um, we have a teacher's portal on our website, which has somewhere between 50 and 100 things in it um, along those lines. Different lesson elements and pieces, um, and some others that we're still developing. Um, so we started that phase by um, taking the um, principles that we developed and um, distilling those into more classroom-style learning objectives. You know, What do we want students to know, and what do we want students to be able to do? So um, in the case of your information footprint is larger than you think. Um, so we want students to be able to give examples of um, how their online and offline activities add to their information footprint. Um, we want them to be able to um, review privacy settings to kind of understand um, what the consequences are of different settings um, and to be able to ask themselves those questions about what do they want. Um, so one of the things that we have is a um, Excuse me. Um, educational. We have a couple of educational apps. Um, these are kind of the, the highest cool factor. Um, so let's see. Um, this one, um, basically, you can enter your um, Twitter or Instagram ID, and it will show you a heat map of um, where you've been posting from and a timeline that kind of to give you the idea um, to help people understand. Like this is information. It's, it's not just you know. Oh, this post was from this place. Um, but that people can see all that information, put it together, um, 
figure out the patterns and figure out your habits. Um, I do not have a Twitter account, so I will put in a completely random example here. Um, so you can sort of see, you know, Steve, see where Steve Wozniak frequently posts from. Um, and obviously, I think, I think he probably knows about um, geotags. <laughs> so I, don't, I think he just has decided he doesn't care. Um, but you know, for a lot of people, it, was, it can be really surprising um, to see all this. Um, I mean, a lot of people that you would think know actually don't really realize. And so it's, it's important to be able to give this information. Um, although one interesting fact um, is uh, we, I guess it, 2012, 2013 that we started working on this. I think this app came out in 2013. Um, and at that time, when we would um, show it in labs and, and uh, presentations, you know, probably a bare majority of people would actually get something out and be like, oh, whoa, whoa, I didn't know people could see that. Um, or maybe they would say, I don't care. But you know, uh, people would see it. Um, that has actually changed over the last few years. Um, this has um, become, I don't know if I want to say less necessary, but it is less the case that people, that fewer, fewer of the people that we see try it um, actually get something out. Because and that's in part, um, in particular, Twitter is you know, one of the things that we use, and in particular, I think Twitter has changed. So um, location services is now, I think, opt in instead of opt out, or at least it was for a while. Um, and also, but also people are becoming more aware, um, which is, hey, cool, progress. Um, so we also have classroom discussion guides, activities, worksheets, um, for example, um, this sort of brainstorm, students brainstorm about what kinds of things do you do in a day, okay? what. Um, what, does, what kind of data does that activity generate? Um, what can other people do with that information? What could they learn about you? Do you want them to know that about you? Um, we also have um, a, we also have a video series. Um, one of them is up on the website. Hopefully the next four will go up in the next week or so. Um, as Gerald said, got some high speed stuff going on. Um, so I can, I think we've got a little time I'll show it, but oops. Um, show at least part of this video. Basically it kind of covers, it follows the same structure as the website. So here's how it works and here's what you can do. And I forgot to plug in the sound. Right, ah, here we go. Okay. Okay. Their lovely, fruity British narration voice.
It doesn't stop there. When you are posting something on the internet, be aware of what data may be contained in that post. <coughs> Photos and videos can contain metadata in addition to the content you see or hear. For example, so-called exit metadata contains the settings and model of the camera that took the photo, making the source of the photo more identifiable. It can also contain the exact GPS coordinates of the location of the photographer. Even when you're only posting text, you often publish more than meets the eye. The type of browser and operating system and your IP address, as well as the time and date you post, are always logged too. Even the exact geographical location of the place where you posted from can often be embedded in a Facebook or Twitter post, often without your knowledge. We have created an app on our website to help you visualize this called Ready or Not. It shows how little effort is needed to figure out someone's typical daily schedule from seemingly innocuous tweets and Instagram posts. Moreover, when information from different websites and other sources is correlated together, your information footprint can convey an exact and unique picture of you and your life. Companies that do this commercially are called data brokers. More about them in a later video. The bottom line is that your information footprint is larger than you think, but you have some choices you can make to manage your exposure. Thanks for watching. Visit teachingprivacy.org for more information and for sound advice about how to limit the exposure of your information footprint. And while you're there, drop us a line. We appreciate your feedback. So, yeah, so we've got, as I said, the AT portal with um, such like activities. Uh, dip, 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 come on, computer. Okay. Um, so where is this getting used? Where is it getting distributed? Um, as Gerald said, it's um, a lot of it is through um, Berkeley CS10, Beauty and Joy of Computing, which is an undergraduate class um, for non-majors, but it also is, uh, converts a lot of them to computer, converts a lot of uh, undergrads to computer science. Um, so um, Gerald teaches that sometimes, then also um, Dan Garcia, who's one of the founders of the course, um, is also involved in this project. Um, and it is a you know, well-known course, very popular, um, and has been used as a model for a lot of professional development. Um, and so, a lot of so some of the teaching privacy stuff has gone into um, those materials. Um, and also, in, um, specifically, Beauty and Joy of Computing um, is one of the models, one of the pilots for um, AP Computer Science Principles, which um, it actually just started this year. Um, the previous College Board AP Computer Science things were all very programming focused, so this is more. Um, looking at um, the sort of computer science in terms of the basic underlying principles, including um, its global impact, um, which is how privacy gets in there, especially uh, data privacy. Um, then also, um, it was, it's been used in a couple of summer camps for high school students um, that we've been involved in. So the Berkeley Foundation for Opportunities Information Technology, BFOIT, um, used to be a program at ICSI. Um, then more recently, 2015-2016 uh, was the Cyber um, Summer Camp at Berkeley, which is a one-month um, camp for high school students um, focusing on cybersecurity. Um, and in that case, um, I think they were they found that um, talking about online privacy made a good kind of entree or um, context a way to contextualize um, the more technical topics to kind of give give students a hook um, as they were getting into those things. Um, so um, what's next? Um, so our, yeah, we're, we're kind of winding down. Our um, current grant period actually ends tomorrow. Um, but um, we have a lot of other things, sort of ideas or things in the works. Um, for example, with the kind of with the content that we currently have, um, redoing it for um, peer education networks, using peer education networks. We have some uh, middle school materials that we've sort of started, but um, we need to finish. Um, we'd like to translate some of them. Um, then um, and s um, maybe get some more apps. We've got some apps we're kind of in process on. Um, then um, on kind of new types of content, um, we also want to think about how to um, tie privacy more to programming um, so that CS teachers can kind of more feel like it makes sense to bring this into the classroom. Um, and that's actually something, um, again, with the computer science principles that's also a focus there. So um, and I'm also working on a project on that. Um, so I, we're trying to figure out how to make those connections. Um, also, privacy for um, 
and also looking at frameworks of how um, privacy is used in um, computer science and data science classes for uh, majors and what can be added there. And also, you know, public, um, yes, tell it, uh, educate everybody. Um, so uh, this has been a several year project, lots and lots and lots of people involved. Um, they're in, in, at UC Berkeley XE, um, very interdisciplinary team. Um, so we invite you to check out the website, um, teachingprivacy.org. Um, and you know, let us, in any, any, if anyone is uh, interested in getting involved in any future projects, you know, let us know. Yes, let me give you the mic so that we can all hear it. Uh, yeah, so could you um, expand a little bit more on the reaction from teachers themselves? Have they changed their behavior? What have they learned from this curriculum? Um, I may give that question yeah, to Gerald, so who's uh, had more interaction there. So the, the reactions from teachers are as diverse as the teachers. Um, um, mostly, of course, it's super positive. And in what happens when I go to, like, for example, CSTA meetings, it's Computer Science Teachers Association meetings, then they're all like, yes. But then they, they, they have one issue, which is if they teach this as part of computers, so it so depends on which state. So in California, there's a specific issue. In California, of all states, the issue is that it's not clear where computer science belongs, right? So is it a science, is it, a, is it math, or is it something else? And so most computer science teachers make the case that computer science is math and sciences, right? So now if they introduce social topics like this, they get dinged because it's not math and sciences, right? And then one of the teachers said, I'm actually gonna be fired if I teach this. And it's like, okay, well, how can we help you? So the way to help them is to integrate code examples into teaching privacy. So the, p the point is like, they teach programming in terms of like encryption and so on, and then along that, they can actually motivate that, right? There's it's also uh, another movement which we had in before it's that they were basically uh, not before the, the the Berkman Foundation for Opportunities and Information. No, the the, the, the other cyber. one, the, the cyber, yeah. where you basically motivate programming with sort of security issues and privacy issues. So th this is kind of the conflict we have. And other states, I think, what was it, North Carolina? I don't know. One of these states where they're just okay, yeah, let's just do that. Done, right? It's, it just depends on where computer science uh, stands in the curriculum and it's interestingly enough in California there's the there's an interesting issue yeah okay I think there was one and then yeah. we can definitely come back to you another question yeah I saw you, you want to say something? No? Okay. okay well then uh, go ahead so uh, on on the same note um, have you received I mean you're basically teaching people how to use ad blockers um, a lot of the information in here is kind of pointing you towards limiting your own uh, your own footprint. And have you gotten any pushback from tech or from people in the tech industry that you are not really playing along with their business model? Um, so first of all, no. Um, as we don't teach them to use ad blocker. I mean, yeah, th this would be one of the many things uh, to do. But mostly, we have this issue that even the tech people didn't know what they're doing, right? So basically, the point here is, uh, with, with for example, at embedding the geotags into photos. Um, this seems like a good idea until it's so accurate that you can pinpoint home locations and you can actually, then there was this I can stalk you site and, and we, we brought up the notion of cyber casing so you can actually build a script on YouTube 200 lines and find houses to rob in the Bay Area based on geotags and people not, not at home and so on, right? So, so mostly the reaction was more like, oh my God, you need to do something, yeah. So keying, I suppose that's a pun, keying off of uh, what you just said, 
much of what was being described is about teaching the consumer side of, for awareness and the, le the little control that they can actually have. But this is going into the issues of teaching designers and programmers. And from what I've seen, there's not very coherent sense of what does it mean to program and design in a way that pays attention to privacy issues, improving control, limiting uh, uh, the amount of information that's disclosed and those sorts of things. People have lots of anecdotes of the type that you've been doing, but no coherent sense of what it means to um, choose to disclose information or to choose to hide information uh, and, and improve users' ability any sense of how to attack that? Because that, to me, seems like the leverage point for all of the programmer and designer side. Well, I think it's a pro, yeah, I was going to say it. It's, <laughs> um, I mean, the short answer Maybe is. Maybe the microphone. <laughs> so everybody can hear. I mean, so there is the whole privacy by design movement. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Um, I, I think, you know, part of it is an, it's an economic problem, right? So, um, you know, if you talk to software engineers about why aren't you thinking about this problem, well, yeah, people in the privacy space, this is a big problem. We do research on this, but, you know, when you're building a software, this isn't, you know, this is one concern of many others. Um, and so I think that, yeah, a lot more needs to be done about, um, you know, making this issue more, you know, talked about, um, because I suspect that in many cases it's not a matter of being outright, you know, wanting to be malicious. It's often just an oversight. Um, but then there's the business question of if you have a limited number of dev resources, how do you do that? What do you do? You know, uh, you know what do you minimize to make room for this? And yeah, I think that's a very good question. Just to, as a matter of... <laughs> I know in in in, uh, in engineering there's the uh, uh, there's kind of like an engineering ethics around that for computer science or, or or software engineering is there such a thing as like a privacy code of conduct or ethos that is being taught in these curricula? Uh, so the, the interesting thing is that yes, if you're an engineer who builds bridges. Sorry. <laughs> then you have a lot of code to follow to make sure the bridge will not collapse, right? And um, right now the ethos, and this is another project we're working on, is called uh, Dark Data, is actually collect as much information as you can and make as much money as you can with it. That's the ethos. Um, it's mostly not from developer. Yeah, it's, well, so, um, I mean, we went to a conference. So uh, the point here is I think this is not a blame on the developers, by the way. Um, the developers, I think, okay, that's just my, you know, gross generalization. My gross generalization is that the developers usually don't, just don't care. But then the sales and marketing uh, side is really on, like, let's make money with all this data. And so we went to a conference, to, to a couple, actually, and one especially in, in San Francisco, where this is basically about uh, sort of this online marketing and data trading. And they say, oh, yeah, we give you a license plate to name conversion. And I'm asking... Uh, how does this work, right? I mean, DMV doesn't give that out. It's like, oh, yeah, no, but Jiffy Loop does. It's like, oh, interesting. So how does that work? Well, it works by the software that is in the different um, sort of when you put your car, right? They have a man management software, like, oh, and, and they put all the data in, and then that software will actually collect the data, and that software company will sell the data. So so that's the problem, right? So, so that whenever somebody gets a grip on data, the business model is not just licensing the software, let's say to the individual uh, car mechanics, but then also to take all the data and sell it out. And I think that is the point where, where things have to change. Um, um, I, it is changing though, right? I mean, from right. talking to companies. In the past few years, and you know, now we're in the age of you know, massive data breaches that happen very regularly and make the news and result in class action lawsuits, um, that's, you know, promoted some amount of awareness so that, you know, at, at least you have lawyers at, you know, companies that are now thinking about, you know, well, we have this data which might have potential value, 
but in the meantime, that's creating massive liabilities for us. Um, and so, you know, right now, I think we are starting to see some shifts towards, you know, limiting data collection to only what's needed to try and prevent that liability. Um, I, I use a VPN anytime I go on the internet. Am I, is that worth anything? Uh, is it, do you recommend VPNs at all? Well, it depends on what you want to protect. Uh, just, you know, anonymous, you know. I know I can't keep anybody off my computer, but just prevent tracking. Well, you're actually more trackable than VPN. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> That's what I'm afraid of, yeah. Any other questions? Yes, let me give you the microphone also. Question, I guess, for both groups. What browser do you recommend? <laughs> what internet browser? Hmm. I can recommend one, <laughs> yeah. I'll recommend one, hmm. <laughs> Does anyone else wanna talk browser well, since I'm the, just a little biased? The business model of the browser will be the question, right? Um, and I mean, the point is, we, we do know what Google makes their money off. Um, and I don't not, I'm not really sure what, you know, Microsoft makes the money off in their browser model. Um, you can comment on what, how Mozilla makes money. So I think uh, it, 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 that's the question you have to ask yourself. And in fact, I want to generalize from this question because it is an interesting lesson. Uh, do you use Android or iPhone? Right, well, I, this is a general question. I, I, I don't want to know from you, so sorry to invade your privacy, but the point is, <laughs> do, you use, do you use Android or iPhone? Is for many people a $10 decision, or I get this better contract, or so on. It's much more than that, right? Apple sells gadgets, which actually is how they make money, mostly. And the data seems to be more protected. Um, and Google, well, doesn't make money off the cell phone because Samsung might be the seller, right? So they make the, of the operating system, they make it from advertising. So in Android, everything is like about your data. So that's the big difference. And I think I like the question because yes, the same goes for what browser do you use, what operating system do you use, what gadget XYZ do you use? Ask yourself what the business model is. And then, um, you know, I, I often said if there was a Facebook where I could pay rather than them sharing my data, I would probably pay for it. Yeah. The, the search engine you choose has a bigger impact than the browser you use. Yeah. Well, and I think it also gets down to what are you looking to do and what you're comfortable with your trackability and what your ease of access is is that your like what's your convenience level? Like what what are you willing to if you understand the ecosystem and you're understanding what information is being given out and you're comfortable with that level of information being given out for the convenience that you're getting in return, then it's okay for you to use that operating system. But what you're using might not be okay for me. And so I might use Tor when I'm looking up certain things that I don't wanna be tracked fully, or I might use disconnect search, or I might use something different. But I also might, un I also have to understand that if I use different searches, I'm outside of my filter bubble, and so I'm not gonna get some of the search results the same way. So filter bubbles are, are great, and also horrible, right? Like, so, so they're great because I, I get back the search results that are really, generally speaking, what I actually want to get back, but sometimes I need to know that I'm in it so that I can get outside of it to get results back that um, are, are outside of that area to see what, what a bigger perspective on an issue is. And just uh, one other sounding board off of that. A lot of times, so we, when we were making our Get Started Today page, um, we had a bunch of different like ad blockers and stuff like that. It can break a lot of sites that you really maybe you want to go to, but at least it, you know, provides awareness that, okay, I know I'm not as private if I'm going on this site. So that's another thing to think about. So the monologue you just did is a textbook version of things that we do in the technical community, which put a burden on to end users that exceeds their capacity at the beginning and the middle and the end. 
They, it expects them to understand too much. It expects them to make decisions at registration or equivalent time. And then worst of all, it expects them to make decisions at, at, in real time. And on the average in the mass market, nobody's going to do any of that. So we have a basic problem trying to figure out how to um, design things in ways that make that burden manageable for the mass market. And it tends not to show up in most of these kinds of discussions. I think you're spot on. I think it would be nice to not have any of our products have to exist. <laughs> uh, I mean, when it really gets down to it, right? Like, it would be nice to have an ecosphere where there was this code of conduct, um, where people were not making money off all of our data. Um, that's not the internet that we have right now. So uh, how do we how do we manage to navigate through what we do have, and how do I think it's really great to start talking about it in computer science classes and to start talking about it more, um, but not just with developers though. Like how do we how does it get further into the ecosphere of how do companies make money um, if they're not using your data? You know, we've built a free internet, but. It's free, and that it's uh, it's free. It's free monetarily. It's it's you know we're we're the product, right? Um, so if that service model changes, what does that look like? Because now you've alienated a whole group of people who all they have in order to access the internet is their data, and they don't have funds. Um, and so like it, it's it's such a I mean it's so, it's so complicated. It's convoluted. Um, I don't there's not I don't have an answer. Or none of us do, right? Um, but I think you hit on a really important key point. Okay, so I was just looking at my um, time, and it looks like we have um, about 10 minutes left before we're scheduled to end, so I think this might be a good place to break it off, and if you do still have questions, to just be able to mill around and ask people individually. So for the next 10 minutes, we can all sort of chat with each other, and thank you so much to everyone for coming and to our speakers for presenting.